Right, on to our talk this evening. Um, and our speaker, Steve Cully, hardly needs an introduction. I know, but I should do him that honor um, because he's such an amazing guy. Um, I know many of you know him intimately well because he's your dentist. Um, but even if he's not your dentist, you will know the name and know the face and recognize the noise um, of Steve Cully. He's originally from St. Helens in Merseyside, and he graduated in Liverpool, University of Liverpool, but he moved to uh, Fair Isle in 1996, uh, where his wife, Rianne, is from. He's one of the most extensively traveled bird watchers I know, both within UK, he makes every effort to see every bird if he can, um, as well as far flung places abroad. He's got a fantastic breadth of knowledge of birds as is revealed every time we have a Christmas quiz or indeed whenever we have a speaker uh, from another part of the world talking about birds from remote places. They're not that remote to Steve because he's been there, seen them and tick them off. Tonight he's going to turn his attention to the eastern Mediterranean, the island of Lesvos, which he visited in 2013 with his family. And he's going to tell us all about that experience, um, one which you know, I hope is on everybody's radar because it is an incredible part of uh, Europe and one which thankfully, once again, will be uh, more accessible. So, Steve, thanks for doing this to finish off our brilliant season. Uh, over to you. Thank you very much. Yep. Okie dokie. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, I'm just going to share my screen now. And whilst you're doing it, I, if I could ask people to turn their videos off. Thank you. Uh, Nearly there. Not not full screen yet. Okie dokie. Right here. Okie dokie. Right here. Well, thank you very much. Uh, thanks, everyone, for... Um, uh, for everything that you've done for Burr Group over the last year or two. Um, yeah, tonight I'm going to be talking about uh, a trip I did in 2014 um, to the Greek island of uh, Lesbos, uh, or Lesbos. Um, and I'll do the usual quick run through about where I came from and an introduction to my family, because uh, I think it's, you know, quite important, especially with regards to the talk tonight, because it is called My Family and Other Animals on uh, Lesbos. So um, here's a picture of me in the field watching a grey phalarope. Um, I'm originally from uh, St. Helens. Um, and some of my, my claims to fame, I went to school with Johnny Vegas. And there's a picture of Johnny Vegas in the middle of my school photo with me just to the bottom right with the cheesy Beatles haircut. Uh, one of my other claims to fame is this is uh, Dick Kerr's Ladies, a very famous, uh, one of the most famous early women's football teams. And on the right, that's Lily Parr. Now, she's my great auntie, so that's my grandma's sister. And Lily Parr, uh, she played um, ooh, over 800 games. Uh, Dick Kerr's Ladies became Preston North End, and she scored almost 1,000 goals in her career. And in 2002, she was the only woman to be made an inaugural inductee into the English Football Hall of Fame at the National Football Museum in uh, Manchester. And if you go there, they've got this walkway. They've got people like Maradona, uh, Pele, Thierry Henry and Lily Parr next to them. So, uh, so that's pretty amazing. And they've actually got a section for it in the National Football Museum in Manchester. So um, there's, there's me with the family uh, with the statue of Lily Parr. So... Coming from St. Helens, it's got quite an industrial background, uh, but luckily where, where I came from, we lived just on the outskirts with the Lancashire Mosslands behind, and it was quite a, a well-wooded garden, uh, wood and fields behind. So it was a great place to sort of grow up. So I was exposed to wildlife from, uh, from quite a young age. And, you know, there's a picture of me at Leighton Moss looking a bit cheesed off there with my mum. Uh, I'd just been looking for bitten and unfortunately not spotted any. Um, so that's why I'm looking slightly glum. Uh, but there's me looking out of the hide there at Leighton Moss. Now, I was exposed to dead birds as well from a young age because uh, my dad, actually, he did go shooting. 
Um, but don't start booing him because he did turn away from the dark side of the force as he got older. And we did go on some cracking bird watching trips together, mainly to Scotland. And there's a picture of him at uh, Lock Garden, which is a great place in winter to sort of hand feed the cold tits and watch crested tits as well. Now, I suppose being exposed to um, uh, birds, dead birds from a young age, it's not surprising that I... Um, two seconds for me it's not surprising um you know that i got into taxidermy as a teenager um but i quickly sort of uh, phased out of that and i suppose it was only natural progression that i moved on from stuffing birds to filling teeth so uh being from st helens i wasn't actually into rugby league um so when i finished university at liverpool um i, I had to leave town uh, but luckily when i was in liverpool i met rianne uh, who was from uh, chemice uh, she likes to play hockey. Uh, that's her main sort of uh, interest. Uh, but she's from Anglesey. And, uh, and we all know, uh, living in this part of the world, it's a fantastic place to live uh, in North Wales. And there's also some great bird life. Now, qualifying as a dentist, thankfully, in 1996, there was also tooth decay was varied and plentiful. And the mere mention of a new dentist coming to town and a queue would form around the corner. So we had two young dentists here, newly qualified, an area lacking in dentists. So we were set up as a captive breeding program and there's three little baby dentists in theory. So this is Nia. Um, I have tried to expose the kids to as much wildlife as I can from a young age. It's sort of, I regularly do the moth trap. There's Nia with an elephant hawk moth. And uh, we used to go and see Ken's uh, slow worms quite often. Uh, so great to sort of uh, show the kids wildlife. And we do also like to do a lot of rock pooling. Uh, chem ice uh, is good for rock pooling and so is Kemlin, which is just on our doorstep. So there's uh, there's uh, Chris with a lobster. And, uh, you know, if, whatever I've found over the years, I've always tried to expose the kids to it. And, uh, and there's Sean uh, feeding some uh, scarlet ibis. Uh, so that was, that was good fun. Now, before we had children, um you know we had it we made a decision i asked my wife i said what do you want to do next year do you want to do you want to have kids or should we go and see tigers in india and uh, we actually sort of decided uh that we'd, we'd we'd start having kids and so i i've not I've, I've got to put tiger on hold until uh sort of one day where i can go with rian to see tiger because i think she'd be very unhappy if i went off and saw tiger without her but luckily she did let me go uh, at least one uh, exciting birding holiday abroad a year. So I've been lucky over the years, managed to go to places like Morocco, to see things like cream colored corsairs, Central America to see rough splendid quetzal, and uh, Cuba to see the smallest bird in the world, the male bee hummingbird. But I have had to take the odd bullet for the team. Uh, in 2013, um, she, she, uh, she made us go to Disneyland in Paris. And the next photo is a picture of me living the dream uh, by Cinderella's castle. Obviously, you can see that I'm uh, I'm well made up for that. But uh, we spent five days there. But the 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 carrot, so I behaved uh, when we were there. Was we were going on to Germany because the uh, the biggest bird zoo in the world, or one of them, is in uh, northern Germany. So they've got some really unusual stuff, things like Schubel stork and and kagu, uh, uh, the former from Uganda, and this this is from uh, New Caledonia. So they've got some pretty unusual stuff there. So choosing a holiday with the family, it's always quite difficult because. Uh, the weather in the UK can be quite unpredictable. Um, so, and I, I, we did go to Butlins once and, um, you know, not my cup of tea. Again, the, the carrots, so I behaved while we were there, was we were going out to Cornwall so I could do a bit of sea watching for a few days afterwards. But I thought, you know, Lesbos, now that there's a trip where you could combine um, birding uh, and some new birds, some, you know, really exciting new birds with, with a family holiday. So, um, so, so we, I sat down, I wrote the, uh, the aims and objectives. Uh, I, I don't know if anyone else writes names and objectives of the holiday, uh, but th this holiday to Lesbos was to see Krupa's Nuttach, Cinerius Bunting, Middle Spotted Woodpecker, Olive Tree Warbler, Western Rock Nuttach, Somber Tit, maybe White Throated Robin. And there's also some good birds that I'd seen before, because I'd, I'd not seen the previous ones before. Uh, things like Mashrite, Rupel's Warbler, and Kretz Mars Bunting uh, would be really good to see. Plus, of course, to spend some quality time with the family. So we got ready for the holiday, sort of, uh, Sean was quite eager to go. So we, uh, he obviously wanted to be packed away in there. So we had a, an early morning departure from Manchester. Nia, part of the reason we'd not been on a plane before, because this was Nia's first time on a plane, is because she was really scared of flying. So you can see she was quite uh, apprehensive at the start. There's me tempting her with the suite. 
Uh, Reese is very adventurous, and so going on a plane was something he was really looking forward to. So we were quickly heading off east towards the Greek islands. Uh, it's quite funny because the kid near was nine and a half, Reese was eight, and Sean was four, so they were quite small at that time. So they were kind of rooting around like ferrets when we were on the plane, getting into places that you know I could only dream of actually fitting into. Um, so Neo was quite happy uh, once we were up and away. So there's some, there were, but even back then there were some good books which I'd still recommend reading if you're going now because there's good maps. Work from uh, Richard Brooks and Steve Dudley, um, and also I got I got some information from uh, Bill and Jill Slade. Uh, they've been there quite a few times, uh, so they gave me some information. And Reg Thorpe uh, from the RSPB. Uh, he's he's done quite a few tours over the years to uh, to Lesbos. Um, it, it's a great place to sort of go. A nice Greek island, and it's got some exciting, scarce Eastern European birds that breed there, and it's also good for migration as well. Um, I've just put this. We didn't go on an organised trip. We, we we just went through a normal travel agent, booked accommodation and booked a flight. Uh, the only reason I've put this in is just to show you that the main weeks when people tend to go are roughly between the 18th of April and the 9th of May. Now, due to restraints with school, we ended up going in the May uh, half term, which is later on in May. So uh, we we didn't get. The, the spring migration as such, but all the breeding specialities were in, which was probably better because if we'd have gone at peak migration season, I do have a feeling that my family might have seen less of me than they did otherwise. Um, so Lesbos is in Eastern Europe, in Greece. And when you see uh, a, a picture of the, the Greek archipelago, you can see Lesbos, Turkey, that's broken off and floated out to sea which is probably why some of the birds that you get there um, are more of a flavour as what you'd expect to get uh, if you go to, to Turkey. Yeah, so righty ho. So this is a map of Lesbos uh, itself. Um, the, the airport is at the bottom right hand side, uh, but we were staying in Scala Colony, which is just at the north side of like this inland sea. Uh, it's about an hour from the airport and we were birding mainly sort of where these red dots are. So it was mainly on the western half of the island. Um, so, um, yeah, we, we picked up the hire car, uh, which was a little bit sort of manky. Um, so you kind of get an idea of what the driving might be locally. And uh, we, they, they kind of put a, a, a child seat in for Sean that he just about fitted into. Uh, and we headed off to Scala Colony, which is where we were staying. And as, as we just before we got to our digs, uh, you passed some salt pans. So th that was brilliant because, you know, we got to see flocks of flamingos, you know, something that the kids have never seen before in the wild. So that was nice. We were staying in a hotel called the Alonian Gare. Um, it, it was a really nice hotel, to be fair. Um, there were hardly any people there staying there. So, you know, we pretty much had the place and the pool to ourselves, which was brilliant. So obviously we had to do some family stuff straight away, really handy pool, sort of beautiful weather, uh, fantastic, just to sort of unwind from uh, from the flight. But, you know, couldn't help but to start with, you know, a little bit of wildlife around the pool because the house martins that were nesting locally were coming for a drink and there was a clouded yellow butterfly that had just come into the pool. Um, around the gardens of the hotel, there was some, um, you know, good wildlife this is eastern olivaceous warbler so just feeding in the in the bushes around the hotel which were close and uh, good good to see now this is tony white as i'm sure most of you know um you know more often seen at kemlin photographing things like snow buntings um but tony'd been to uh, lesbos before and he'd warned me you know when i said i was going to lesbos he said like this is the face he pulled it beware the place is full of snakes so um, he was telling us some of the stories of, of, of many of the snakes that he saw. Um, we got there and after a quick dip in the pool, we just went off a little ride to the nearby countryside right past the hotel. And I'm not joking, one of the first things that, when we turned off a dirt track, one of the first things that crossed the road in front of us was an Ottoman viper, um, a really stunning looking snake. Um, and it's got this really cool patterning on it. Um, so it was it was a bit of a, one of these moments where it's like, oh, look at the snake, brilliant, but kids, stay in the car, stay in the car. I got out because I wanted to take some photographs of it because it was a really cool snake that I'd heard about and not seen. Um, but 
it's you know it's one of the most dangerous snakes in Turkey and and obviously in in uh, in, in Lesbos the Ottoman viper it says like the the venom of the snake possesses it is capable of causing severe complications that can pr uh, be prolonged and potentially even result in death. So, um, you know, due to the chance of it, it being encountered, which it is quite common, uh, this snake is often considered to be one of the most dangerous animals in Turkey. And from what I saw of it, I didn't want to get too close because it looked like it could be the sort of snake that could go for you. Um, other creepy crawlies that you get there, we didn't see any, um, but, you know, there are some scorpions there. And these are one of the things you've got to be a bit careful with. It's always been handled here. There's, there's some centipedes that apparently can give you a bit of a bite um raymond purser he's a british birder that just he goes out there quite a lot and does some great photography and uh, so here's a picture of a, he got of a little owl out there eating one of these uh, these centipedes apparently they bite the head off first just to uh, to avoid being bitten themselves but coming to some of the photography that i got round to uh, in our first afternoon after the uh, incident with the ottoman viper um, you know, getting great views of black-headed bunting, uh, you know, singing in the fields around there. Absolutely stunning looking bird. Bee eaters, uh, they nest around there. So it's great to show the kids bee eaters just sitting on a wire just above the cars we were traveling around. So as where we were staying, it was just a walking distance into uh, Scala Colonia. There's a lovely little square there. Uh, it's a great place. There's loads of little restaurants, so you can just go in there and uh, choose a different restaurant each night if you want. Uh, but you can see after a long day being on the plane and seeing a bit of wildlife, the kids were absolutely shattered, um, all looking uh, a bit uh, hot and bothered and ready for bed. So I snuck off um, while Rianne was putting the kids to bed because uh, Robin Sandham, uh, he was actually staying just around the corner. And there's a Hotel Pacifay, which is really you know, really close to where we were, we were in Scala Colony. And they, they have a, a log book there um, where people, birders put in what they've seen. And it's just a great source of knowledge to see what's bang up to date there. So I went for a quick slide beer with Robin and uh, went to see what was there. Now, there's also uh, Lesbos Birders um, Facebook page, which gives you up to date photos and information, which was great. Um, there's also the Lesbos Birding site. Uh, it's a little bit like a crosswind bird track, rare bird alert, and, 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 and it puts records out there. But there's also like a GPS uh, reference. You can see where the bird's been reported from. So you can, uh, you can go and see, see what's about. And uh, we had a reasonable map as well that helped us to sort of navigate around the island. So on the, on the first um, proper morning, uh, we went to, uh, I think, because what I normally do, I get up before dawn and I go off bird watching for a couple of hours while the rest of the family are snoozing away in bed. Uh, there's a place just to the west, I don't know, about 20 minutes from Scala Colony called Parrot Killer. And uh, so these were like the, the first, you know, the second day, first morning. It was great to see things like Red Rump Swallow, uh, Western Rock Nuttatch. Uh, obviously, we our, our Nuttatches live in woodland. These are on like sort of rocky, um, rocky sort of hillsides with small shrubs and small trees. So uh, really nice to see. And Sombatit, again, uh, another Eastern speciality uh, um, tit that I'd, I'd never seen the species before. So it was great to see it. And it's great to see them uh, up close where you can get good photographs of them. Uh, the countryside is full of like oleander bushes and uh, breeding uh, black eared wheat ears uh, of the eastern form, the eastern species. Um, so this is the um, Colony, Scala Colony area. There is a big pool in the middle of the village, which used to be really good um, for like migrant birds coming in, you know, white and black terns and, and waders, but it was really overgrown when we went, went there. So it, it wasn't much good for much bar things like zitting cystic olas. Um, so I don't know if that's changed at all, but some of the main birding areas are around Scala Colonias. There's, uh, there's the river uh, Tiskneas to the east, otherwise called the Eastern River. And there's a, there's a, a ford down at the, uh, at the bottom end, uh, which is a really good place for, for watching birds and also for doing photography. Um, so there's, a, there's a, a few sites around the, uh, where we were staying. Uh, yeah, this is the lower ford. You, you have to be the first day if you want to use your car as a portable hide because there's very there's, there's quite limited parking, really, and some people get in and get the best spots. But the, you can see how close the car is to the river um, and, and you can get great photographs and views of birds just, just from the car. 
uh, things like that we were getting around there, things like beta, uh, birds coming down to drink. Uh, this is a female black-headed bunting. Uh, and then there's a male. During peak migration time, you'll get flocks of like loads of wagtails and warblers and, and buntings and things coming down. And also early on the season, you tend to get red-footed falcons migrate through, but they'd all gone through by the time we were there. Uh, and that's a, I think, female type black headed uh, yellow wagtail. Uh, yeah, I said Raymond Purser was there when, I, you know, he, he got some great photos on, I think, one of our first days, like, because Little Bitten, uh, I think they, uh, they they frequent uh, the river there and quite often uh, come out of the, uh, the tamarisk uh, bushes. And you can get great views of them if you're lucky. Uh, birds I had when we were there, black stork just wading around in the river. And then after, you know, a couple of hours birding, I'd get back, I'd always meet the family at nine o'clock, usually sort of, they were just about to go for breakfast or um, they'd literally just just loaded the plate. So, so I'd, I'd meet up with, uh, with the rest of the family at nine uh, when they were sort of uh, ready, ready for food. So we'd, we'd have a, a little bit of a, a morning in the, in the pool then for an hour or two. So uh, as you can see, the kids were having great fun there, um, just sort of, you know, typical poolside uh, behavior, uh, but, you know, nice, warm outdoor pool, fabulous weather, uh, even chance for a little bit of relaxation. Uh, there's my wife, Rianne, with uh, Sean um, hiding under the uh, the towels just beyond her. And then after we'd had a bit of a time in the pool, we'd usually pop off around about lunchtime uh, to go and get a bite to eat or and go and uh, explore the place. So so there's uh, Sean there. Uh, uh, all, all ready to go. Um, fair play to Rianne, sort of uh, coating them in uh, suntan lotion and making sure that they're not going to get sunburned. So go, going for a, going for an ice cream, obviously, you know, it's funny when you go to different countries and sort of things might titillate you. Like, I noticed this, ch this chocolate ice cream called Scandal Chocolate Orgy. I thought, crikey, you wouldn't get away with that in the UK. So uh, I took a photograph of, uh, of that very tasty uh, Cornetto type ice cream at the same time. But Sean, who, uh, bear in mind, he was only just four at the time, was wondering why dad was photographing his ice cream. So, so Sean then insisted that dad took a photograph of his ice cream because he thought that his ice cream was just as good as my ice cream. So then went off to see the uh, flamingos again because they were just around the corner. And then, uh, so the, the shorebirds, it's basically mainly the, the resident breeding species that we were seeing, things like Kentish plover, uh, things like black wing stilt, um, and like Avocet. Uh, I mean, earlier on the season, you're getting things like breeding plumage curly sands going through. I think broadbill sandpipers go through there. Uh, it's it's really really good, you know. And, and there's there's a lot more birders earlier on the season, so it, it can be a bit twitchy there. But as I say, we it was a it was more um, of a level pace that that we were working at, and uh, um, so we could do other things as well. And, and crested larks were they they were quite common around the coat countryside. So then we'd usually go off for a bit of a drive and because it was a bit warm, the kids would uh, usually nod off and then uh, they'd, 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 you know, they'd usually wake up at the end of a dirt track or something. Uh, and it's like, where's dad gone? Oh, it's like he walked down that track about a quarter of an hour ago. Um, but uh, what, what happened here is we'd, we'd headed off around a lot of the roads. They're OK, you know, but they are quite windy. Um, we went off to... Uh, the uh, Ipsalu Monastery. Uh, if you look on the book, that's on the front cover of uh, one of the bird watching guides, uh, because it's it's predominantly it's it's a, the best type for for this bird. This is the Cynerius bunting that you get in Lesbos and 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 Turkey and a little bit further east. So again, quite a specialist bird, and uh, and it didn't fail to sort of show. So we got to see that. That's uh, Cynerius bunting. Uh, they were singing up in the trees. And uh, there's Nia. She was actually looking quite chuffed that she'd actually managed to see the uh, the specialist bird, the Cyanerius bunting. Um, other birds around there, um, Isabella and wheat ear bred around there. Um, that's Eastern black eared wheat ear. That's a female. And as we were heading back, this this flew across the road. Initially, I thought it was Sardinian warbler, and then when it landed, and I realised it was actually huge and it had a pale eye. Um, it was actually a, a male Orphean warbler. So so that was uh, that was great to see. Um, so yeah, next morning, uh, we tried Matochi Lake, which is just to the west. It's only about 15, 20 minutes tops from Scala Coloni. Uh, it is a good place in April for little crakes. People get fantastic photographs like this shot that Raymond Purser got. Um, but cause we were there going towards the end of May, I think the best thing we had like that was Moorhen, unfortunately. So, uh, 
I think all the crakes have pretty much gone through by then because we, we didn't have any. Um, there did seem to be quite a few terrapins there. Um, lovely picture there. There's um, there's a striped neck terrapin. I think it's a dead dog. Uh, it was uh, it, it was feeding on. Um, re reminds me of that lyric from I Am The Walrus. Was it yellow matter custard dripping from a dead dog's eye? And that seemed to be what the terrapins were feeding on by the looks of things. So um, lots of terrapin activity, but unfortunately no little crakes. But the countryside around there is still quite good. Uh, there's this like sort of uh, like open woodland. Uh, nice to see uh, some of the subspecies, like the local race of jay that you get there. Very black cat, very white face. Uh, you know, you can see looking at our jay, uh, very pinky face. But if you come down to the bottom right, you see the white face and the very black cap of Atrocapillus, which is a subspecies that you get in the Middle East, which is the one that you get on Lesbos. Uh, I met up with Robin again, so we were, we were having a look around there because uh, it was it was a good spot for breeding mass shrike. There was a mass shrike that wasn't too far from the road in a like an olive grove, and and the male uh, was showing off his fine colours. So uh, it was it was great to see mass shrike again uh, in full breeding plumage because I'd not seen breeding plumage mass shrike since about 1992. So you know when you've seen a bird 20, 30 years later, it's uh, it's almost like seeing them again for the first time. I'd never seen middle spotted woodpecker before, and Lesbos is a good place for middle spotted woodpecker. Um, so, so you know, it almost looks like halfway between great spot and lesser spotted woodpecker. Um, and I didn't realise until chatting to Alex last night that there's actually four different subspecies. Um, so I presume, I think it's the Anatolia uh, that they get in Lesbos, because that's the one in Western and Southern Turkey. So that, that, that would make sense. Uh, some of the other cool things we saw there's um common swallowtail butterfly and then it was back to the pool uh, to spend a bit more time uh, with the family so i think this afternoon we went off uh, there was a stork's nest not too far from where we were staying so uh, it was great to show the kids that the storks on top of the uh, on top of the church uh, build chattering and displaying to each other and when i got the telescope on them you could see the spanish sparrows nesting in the uh, in the actual in the nest itself so you know getting nice views of spanish sparrow there so uh, so that was good to see um one of the other specialities that i really wanted to see was Krupa's nuthatch quite a striking looking little nuthatch that um you get in in sort of uh, lesbos and uh, turkey and i think it just goes into the caucasus um yeah you can sort of see the range there so it's just about in the western end of its range on lesbos um, so again, not too far, probably about 30 minutes drive to um, Akladeri. Um, when we got there, it's just this, this like open uh, pine woodland, um, some nice trails through it. And it wasn't long before we got some stunning views of, of the Krupa's Nuttach, which was uh, really nice to see. And uh, I love this picture because like all three kids, then they were like really eager to like sort of see, see the special birds. So they're all there. Uh, um, tucking into Cooper's nut hatch. So especially with Sean, who can barely hold my Swarovski binoculars up there. So quite a small nut hatch. Uh, just watch it feeding around these large pine cones. Um, quite, you know, nice to see. A very nice looking bird, and uh, one of the specialities of uh, of any trip to Lesbos. Uh, other similar birds, uh, short toed tree creeper uh, inhabits the same uh, same area, and we did actually just bump into the, as we were following the, the nut hatches. Uh, feeding we did actually see one go back to the tree where they nested uh, we didn't know where the tree was and then then we realized when we saw like a skull on a big rock you think oh i think someone's put that there as a sign as for uh, this this is uh, where you go to see the uh Krupa's not at nest which varies from year to year and as we headed back you know some of the sort of little lagoons at the side of the road the, you know nice to see the kids you know watching this close black stalk you know right at the side of the road it's a uh, fantastic views and other birds that were were in the sort of wetter areas thing around there things like ruddy uh ruddy shell duck and uh, and black wing stilt so i think we finished off this next day we headed off to some olive groves um just a little bit further on from uh Akladeri where the Krupa's nut hatches were so um um and it was getting quite late in the day uh, i managed to get some great views and photos of this lovely male uh eastern uh, subalpine warbler 
Um, and I did, I got a brief view of, of one of the other main target species while I was on Lesbos, which was the, um, the olive tree warbler. Um, but it's, it's a, it's, they sing, it's, it's like, they've just divergent evolution. They've, it, it's just like a great reed warbler, but it doesn't live in a reed bed. It lives in olive groves. It sings like a great reed warbler. And uh, it's just like a big one, but it, it, it does look a bit more like Ictreme Warbler. It's got a pale flash in the wing on the tertials like, uh, and secondaries like, uh, like Ictreme Warbler, but the size of it and the song from it is just like Great Reed Warbler. Um, so next morning I picked up Robin and, and we headed off uh, back to the site where I've been with the family the night before to look for the Eastern, uh, so look for the Olive Tree Warbler. Um, he went under this, disappeared under a culvert, so I followed him, and he found this, uh, he'd spotted a, a red rump swallow had been uh, going in, building a nest. And it's a bit like a house spider nest, but it's got this really long tunnel uh, that comes out. And, uh, I mean, Robin, you know, he, he, he's a ringer, you know, so he's quite quite good at finding birds' nests. While he was out there, he, he spotted this little nest of uh, crested larks, and they were only about a day old, and you can see on that chick, it's got the egg tooth still for what it uses like a mini rhino horn to help it just work its way out of the egg. So he'd, uh, he, we were having a little look at this uh, red rump swallow's nest, quite interesting, but there's, there's no way that you can have a, a look or a feel inside unless you had a finger, the, uh, the length of ET. And uh, I didn't realize when I was like looking on a toy website that you can actually get, or you could back in the day when ET was massive, uh, an ET long finger that lit up on the end. And I thought, well, that'd be, that'd be great for investigating a, a red rump swallow's nest, wouldn't it? Um, there's me um, trying to hide as best I can. I was, I was uh, walking, I was stalking woodlarks there because um, they, they breed in some of the open countryside with the pine. Um, so that was nice to see sort of woodlarks, you know, because we don't, don't get them very often in North Wales. So nice to see them. Uh, bump, well, I was going to say bumped into it. I didn't literally bump into it, but this was at the side of the road, a bit of roadkill. This is a, uh, this is a, a beech martin. Uh, beech martins are similar to pine martins that we get in the UK, uh, but they, they don't tend to be as rich coloured and the throat tends to be more whitish instead of that orangey colour that you get in the pine martins that we might see in Scotland. Um, so after we'd seen a few bits and bobs, we went off trying for the olive tree warbler at the same site where I'd, I'd briefly seen one the day before. And uh, after some, some effort, uh, we did finally manage to see one briefly uh, as it landed out in the open. And as, as I said, they, they do look a bit like an Ictrine warbler. They've got those flashes in the wing, but they're, they're about the size of a great reed warbler. It's a very big warbler with a really chunky song. So there's two happy bunnies after, uh, after getting olive tree warbler. And then headed back, dropped Robin off and uh, went for a bit more time in the pool. So uh, he looks as excited as I did when I saw my first olive tree warbler. So we do like to do a bit of rock pooling uh, locally. So we thought we'd have a little mooch around the harbour. And um, when we when we first looked there, you could see it was teeming with uh, life. So we, we bought some, uh, we bought a bucket and some, some nets and we had a little bit of a, uh, like a rock pooling uh, uh, episode uh, a bit of fun uh, just in the harbour and this was just all growing just on the side of the harbour walls there's like loads of snake locks and enemy um there's like these little glass bulb squirts um and um what else was there, there? um no sea urchin uh, and all lots of little fishies in there so uh, really difficult to catch but it, it was great you know for the kids to do a little bit of exploring there and that probably one of the highlights, one of the smallest things we caught was a little baby seahorse. So, uh, so that was nice to see because uh, you know we, um, the kids had never seen a seahorse in a while before. And there's loads of these. They look a little bit gross, but these these are sea cucumbers, uh, and they were like sort of you know bigger than the kid's fist. Um, there was also things on the side. Uh, we had um, uh, spider crab and some like interesting, you know, larger looking hermit crabs than what, what we tend to see when we're rock pooling at Kemlin. So, uh, so there's plenty of stuff there to explore. And there's, there's the sea urchin again, so pretty cool looking thing. And then we'd head back into the, uh, into the square there at Scala Colony, get an ice ice cream. I uh, don't know what the white fronted beater was doing there, but uh, I don't think they've been on Lesbos before, but probably just uh, uh, nice colors uh, like the ice creams that we were eating. So 
we'd have a little bit of a munch on that. And then usually I'd finish first because I was the greediest, which meant I could wander off just behind because there was a, a palm tree where there was uh, Spanish sparrows uh, breeding. So we could uh, get some nice views and photos of those. So later that afternoon, we headed north to a place called Molivos, probably about 45 minutes, maybe our tops, if that, from Scala Colony. Um, that's one of the main sites for breeding uh, Rupel's Warbler. And it was in the book there that they've been seen recently. So, you know, again, going to the Hotel Pasifé was really good because we were getting up to date news as to what was around. So that, so it's directly up from Scala Colony uh, to Molivos up at the top there and managed to get some great photographs, um, you know, because they, they, were, they were busy on territory there. So, uh, you know, they pop up quite often. You get nice views of uh, that's a cracking male Rupel's Warbler. Uh, stunning, stunning looking birds, a bit like Sardinian warbler, but with this lovely black throat. And again, I had not seen them since I think it was 1992 when I'd been to um, Cyprus. So, uh, so it was great to catch up with that bird again, and also see you know turtle dove. The, we had a couple of those like really close, so that that was uh, great views of those. And that's the castle up at Molivos, um, and there's there's a lovely cafe there. So we just went for a drink before we headed headed back. It would have been a nice place to have a glass of wine and watch the sunset, but we, we did have to head back to Scala Colony. But as we came back, um, uh, as we came through some of the hillside, we stopped at this viewpoint and there was there was singing Kretschmar's bunting uh, showing absolutely stunningly well. So, so that was great to see. So next morning, uh, while all, all the family was still in bed, um, I decided to, to go down to the uh, Tiskneas River, the Eastern River, which is in Scala Colony, uh, only you know five minutes in the car um because one of the birds that breed down there that i'd never seen before was the eastern uh well rufus bush jack called back in the day but i think the uh, rufus tail bush robin now so the eastern rufus tail bush robin uh, i wanted to see those now before all the people are out there's loads of like dogs i don't know where they actually sort of had owners or they, they were all sort of semi-feral but they were a bit growly and barky um, so you did have to have your wits about you. I mean, as this dog was coming towards me, it was growling and I wasn't too comfortable. So uh, I did find a big stick. Don't worry, I didn't hit it, but I just made myself look as big and as scary as possible until the the, uh, the slightly ominous looking dog just uh, backed away and left me alone and let me to uh, carry on with trying to uh, find the Rufus bush chats. Um, other bits and bobs there. So it was nice male black-headed yellow wagtail um other birds the uh little bitten uh again not not as good as the photos raymond was getting but at least it was nice to see it out in the open and i did manage to get some stonking views of uh of the roof's tail bush robin in the end um you know so it was nice to see it and it's also nice to get great views of it and there was also beaters just breeding around the river there and other birds things like there's a sub adult uh, an immature uh, night heron so Work that day, so we went back, and then uh, after a bit of time in the pool, uh, our expedition with the family was heading over to the petrified forest. Uh, as we were driving down the roads in the in the middle of the day, you quite often you'd see tortoises on the road. So, uh, so I'd usually stop, um, you know, let the kids, if it was a fun size one, let the kids have a little look and a play with it, um, and then sort of release them um, away from the road so there's less chance of them getting squished. And then uh, Rihanna would be out there with a hand sanitizer to make sure, because I think they can have salmonella. So, uh, because you know that sort of 30 seconds later the kids fingers are going to be in the mouth and what have you so uh, uh but just great to see you know things like this you know different types of wildlife like little tortoises up close so uh sean looks mesmerized there i'm not sure whether it's because he's not long woken up but he i just love that look on his face as he's just staring at this like baby tortoise waiting for it to do something but it was uh really cool to see them up close um where, where we found that there was some nesting little owls and um, so we got to see those uh, in this like old building and Sean's got this perplexed look on his face because uh, I said to him I said uh, I said oh do, do you like it in Greece I said, don't you he said yeah I like it I said what if we sell our house in Chemice and come and move here do you want to do that and like that's why he's got this look on his face it's like oh, I'm not really sure on that one dad yeah but yeah we're heading to the petrified forest uh, it's got this quite relatively large area um I won't go into sort of how it's formed. It's like forms of sedimentation and fossilization. Um, I, I suppose, or you could say that they all looked into the eyes of Medusa and got turned to stone. Um, but one of the one of the other reasons why we were going there is um, 
it, it can some years it has in the past been or had in the past been a good site for white throated robin uh, which is, as I'm sure you'll agree, especially look at the male, it's quite a stunning looking bird, uh, less so the female, but um, you know, it was a bird that was, I really would like to see, but not every year, but most years they might get about one per on the island. Sometimes the news gets out, not always. Um, so we did have a good walk around there. Uh, it was in the midday sun, so it probably wasn't the best time of day because it was absolutely really hot. Um, but yeah, it, it was quite a good area for the kids to have a run around and uh, and, and and see these fossilised trees. And there was some wildlife to see as well. Uh, I think that's Balkan marbled white. Uh, there's quite a few eastern black-eared wheat ears as well, uh, just perching on the uh, on the petrified trees, um, and some isobline wheat ears as well. Um, we found a nice drinking pool. Um, Kretschmar's buntings were coming down to feed there and there had been a, a ruddy shell that sort of uh, there as well. Um, but unfortunately, didn't manage to get white-throated robin. Um, and, and, and like this, this was the scenes in Hartlepool. It gives you an idea of, of like what a cool bird it is. Um, very rare in the UK. Uh, a female turned up in Hartlepool. And it was in a place called the, the Doctor's Garden. Um, we, when it was in there, you couldn't see it, and and there was a, I think there was a local builder. Uh, he was he was charging people twenty quid or something like that. They could stand on top of his van so they could look over the garden and see see the uh, the white throated robin, and, and there was also people taking ladders there. So, but unfortunately, I I because I work Monday to Friday normally, I, I was with the Saturday morning brigade that was the dipping brigade, uh, which can happen quite often. So unfortunately, I still need white throated robin to this day. But we were still in the neck of the woods for Ipsalu Monastery, uh, which was a good place for the Sinerius bunting. But those are the you know, good birds for the trip. Nice male, redback shrike, uh, chucker partridge, similar to the red leg partridge, just less streaky on the throat. And we did have to, because the roads were a bit windy, we did have to edge on the side of caution. The rock pooling bucket was also the sicky bucket. Um, great photo there of uh, Sean. Uh, just after, you know, he was feeling a bit better than he'd thrown up in the car. There's Rianne emptying the vomit from the bucket behind while Sean was legging it down the road um, because I'd given him a shout. I think there was a chucker with chicks I was trying to see. Uh, but uh, So he came down to see them as just as he ran away. And then we, we found some cracking big, I think, spur-thighed tortoise, but there's some really big ones there. And uh, there's Sean inspecting it, so uh, uh, great opportunity to see these these uh, tortoises up close. And there's Nia. She looks like it, she looks like it. she's trying to impersonate David Attenborough there um, as she's carrying this 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 tortoise. And there's also some I think it's Persian squirrels. Uh, quite a few of those were around this monastery. Uh, there's a picture of a of a Western rock nuthatch checking out uh, uh, one of the Persian squirrels. And there's there's me getting a photo of Sean with a tortoise to show to Auntie Sally, which was uh, she was the teacher in his kilk and his play school that he went to at the time. Um, we not a snake, but a, similar to a slow worm. This was a glass lizard. Uh, they're like very large, reddish brown looking slow worms. Unfortunately, you know, a lot of the locals don't really slow down for anything that looks snake like on the road. So. We did see quite a few uh, road casualties of, of this species, and uh, also this this was a this we didn't see many gulls on the trip, but I think there were some yellow legged gulls were trying to carry away this dead uh, whip snake. So this is Caspian whip snake, and we're quite a long, you know, poof, I don't know about over a meter long, um, but it's it is non non venomous. Um, but that was on the road. Um, some of the other birds we saw, there's a rock sparrow blending into the rocks quite nicely. And uh, obviously, Sean was a little bit, he was quite young. So, uh, you know, he spotted the uh, the swings in the garden. So we did have a brief go, um, you know, zooming in there. You can see Sean's having fun, uh, probably me less so, but uh, there we go. Um, next morning, uh, my, my crack of dawn, um, sort of birding excursion was down to the south, probably over an hour's drive uh, to a headland right on the south because, you know, it, it looked good for sea watching on paper. And I wanted to try and get some photographs of some of the seabirds. Uh, predominantly, uh, you've got Scopoli's shearwater. Now, this is the Corrie's type shearwater that is found in the eastern Mediterranean. Um, you know, they're going quite close offshore, so quite good opportunities to take photographs of them. 
Um, but when you're looking at the differences between Corries and Scapolis and and the the variation, it, it is it's quite difficult, you know. But um, you know to, to analyze them. But yeah, it generally is Scapolis, uh, not Corries that you get in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, the Yelkun shearwater, um, the, these were split from Manxes probably about 20 years ago. Because um, in the Mediterranean, you've got Yelkun shearwater in the east and Balearic shearwater in the west. Um, now, if you this this is Manx shearwater. I mean, yeah, to me, I mean, Manx shearwater and, and Yelkun look very similar, right? Balearic are easier to tell because they're just fat and dirty looking. Right, they really look pot-bellied, brown and smudgy. Um, whereas Yelkwins are very similar to Manxes, in, in my eyes. Just they have more of a dark mark on the underwing, which you get less so in Manxes, but you do still see it in Manx shearwaters as well. Like this is Manx shear, this is Manx shearwater, and as these are Yelkwin shearwaters. Um, so you can, when you're looking Collins there, you look at the bottom, Balearic shearwater is quite dusky looking some even look almost a dark sooty shear waters but uh, yelquins and manxies are quite similar but there does tend to be more of a dark marking on the underwing because when i the light i was seeing the yelquins in they, they look very dark on the back like manxies so after i got back after the sea watching uh, the kids have found one of these like sort of uh, giant um green crickets um so that they were having fun playing with that and then we, we did we had an uh, an hour or so of tennis in the hotel, which was uh, which was good fun because uh, my wife's very uh, sports orientated, so we were having a, a tennis lesson because um, the weather's not usually good enough in North Wales to play tennis, uh, so it was uh, it, it was quite suitable for it there. Uh, even I had a go. Um, I mean, in theory, um, this this could have been one of the last. Look a bit like Homer Simpson there. Um, this could have been one of the last times I was running around a, a tennis court. Uh, but it, it was quite good fun. Um, you know, generally it was quite amicable at the start, then got quite competitive, and as usual, ended up in a bit of a brawl. So I think this was when we we blew full time. Uh, that this this signal the end of the game when Nia was uh, was attacking Reese because he'd obviously upset her for something. So, uh, uh, but it, it was quite um, quite humorous though. So we were all 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 happy at the end there. Well, maybe maybe less so me and Reese. So. Um, Late afternoon, uh, went for a bit of a drive, probably 20, 30 minutes out of Scala Colony to a place near Nappy. Went to this little road that went off into the countryside. Some of the birds we had there, things like middle spotted woodpecker, uh, female surl bunting, uh, again, new for the trip. Uh, female Orphean warbler, very large Sylvian warbler with a pale eye, like a large lesser white throat, really. And again, we came into more mass strikes, and uh, so mass strikes are gorgeous birds. And also, it's nice showing kids hoopos because all, all the kids love hoopos because they're well, cracking looking birds. Um, and and also, this was probably one of the places where we actually managed to see nightingale quite well because you can hear them uh, singing deep in the uh, in the oleander bushes. But this one actually was coming out and was uh, belting its song out uh, and showing quite well. So again, this, this was a case where the kids had fallen asleep and then uh, waiting for dad to wander back after sort of 20, 30 minutes down a dirt track. And some of the other birds we had around there again, Western Rock Nuttach and uh, Kretz Mars Bunting. So of an evening, we'd uh, just wander down into the square. Um, I think this might have been one of the last nights. Um, we, you know, this there was a few hotel, a few restaurants to choose from, and uh, we, this one of the ones we liked quite well, and uh, they did have a lot of cats there, and and then I think because it was the last night, uh, Reese spotted some grilled octopus, and and the waiter said to him, "Are you sure you want this?" Normally, it is people that have drunk too much ouzo that order the Greek, Greek order the grilled octopus, uh, but he was insistent, so there he's looking well made up there. He's tucking into his octopus tentacle. Uh, Sort of and having a bit of fun with it as well while he's munching away on it. And uh, even Nia had a bit. I mean, this looks like something from an oral pathology book. Uh, it looks like she's got something wrong with the tongue, but it's not. She just got a big bite of octopus in there with, with the suckers showing nicely. Uh, but me, me and Rianne were sticking to the, 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 this lovely, it's like a lamb hot pot uh, and, and the, the, the mythos uh, beer as well. So uh, that, was, that was our staple diet with the nice chunks of feta cheese in the lamb hot pot. Uh, 
And as we wander back as well, so it's still a bit of wildlife on the on the cards. Scott's owls were 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 calling continuously. So uh, I managed to take the torch one night, and we managed to get it in the flashlight and get some uh, get some photographs. So our final morning um, went back to sort of see the sunrise. Um, and as I was birding the Eastern River, um, got the only views I had on the trip of Eleonora's falcon. Um, so this was uh, this was a juvenile Eleonora's falcon, quite a dark bird. Um, just two seconds. Sorry, I think that was uh, Sean and his mate Kron on the phone, getting a bit noisy. So um, yeah, Eleonora's falcon. Um, the only one that we had on the trip, so that was that was good to see. And going for second helpings of uh, Rufus Tailbush Robin. Uh, I like that shot. It's a bit blurry, but you can get the colours on the tail really nice. That lovely Rufus colour, the black subterminal band and the white terminal band. Absolutely stunning looking bird. And uh, final helpings of bee to the um, always nice to see. And uh, and the black headed bunting, which which its song fills the countryside around there, a bit like corn bunting. It does in parts of uh, of Britain. Um, well, sadly less so, but it's a uh, it's a similar type call, and uh, you know something that you really associate with the Greek Greek countryside. So, uh, headed back there, and it, it was really was fantastic. Um, you know, family holiday. Uh, managed to spend some quality time with the family, and also see some really good birds as well. So, thank you very much for uh, watching and listening, and um, hopefully see you next year. So, thank you. Oh, thanks very much, Steve. <laughs> that was brilliant as ever. Um, will you take a few questions? <clears throat> yeah, yeah, sure. If there's any questions, I'll, I'll answer them. Please, yeah. anybody, if you'd like to <clears throat> ask Steve more about Lesbos. <clears throat> can I can I just start, Steve, by uh, probably asking a pretty obvious question? Obviously, Lesbos has been in the news um, for unfortunate reasons recently, and the, mm -hmm. you know, the tragic. Uh, <clears throat> migration of, of people <clears throat> across uh, the Mediterranean ha has do you know do you know much as to whether that's affected the island um, in any really negative ways <clears throat> for visitors uh, well, I, th I think what happened is initially when when all the immigrants started coming over I think they were cropping up across the island um, it was very sort of ad hoc where, where they were but I think they have actually got a refugee center now but I think that's in the east of the island. Yeah. Because um, I was I was looking it up yesterday. Because I think there were some issues like at the tail end of last year, because some of the, I think the idea was people would arrive. Um, it was a refugee centre, but I think they wanted to move further on into Europe. But I don't yeah. think that was physically possible un unless the official paperwork went was granted. So yeah. I think some of the refugees were sort of staying there and felt that they were sort of imprisoned on the island this is just what i was, I was reading um yeah. but um I, th I think that i think there'll be you know it, it's a big island you know there's, there's, there's a lot of places um you know where where people will will go birding and I, I think especially after the pandemic now i think a lot more people will, will be going back there because it is a place deep in the hearts of a lot of bird watchers because there are people that go there Every like people go to Scilly or Shetland every year. There's a lot of birders that go to Lesbos every year because yeah. uh, the migration is fantastic. And you know you might not necessarily see a new bird, but you know you're gonna. See, it varies from year to year, and you know even if the migration is quiet, there's a lot of really good resident stuff to see. Uh, and it's it's just a a pleasant place to go birding as well. The, you know the weather's fantastic and uh, and it's great Greek culture and food. And not just the birds, as you've amply shown tonight. I mean, the wildlife generally is fascinating, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I was slightly worried when the first thing we saw literally was an Ottoman viper. Yeah. And I thought, I've got three <laughs> young children here. Yeah. Please, they, I, you know, uh, you know, how many Ottoman vipers are we going to encounter? But as it yeah. turned out, it, it was the only one. Um, mm. But again, I was, I was glad to see it because I know people have gone there and not seen them. And it's a fabulous looking snake. It looked it. Any other questions for Steve? <clears throat> Gary, have you heard of any, got any questions there? No? No. Well, if there's no okay. questions, we can just hang around a little bit at the end if anyone well, wants indeed. to we, ask it informally. Yeah, we can be yep. as informal as you like. Mm -hmm. um, but it, uh, 
it's my pleasure to, to thank you, Steve, not just for tonight, um, but of course, for the whole splendid program uh, that you've laid on for us this year, again. Um, it's just been fantastic. I don't think any of us know how you quite manage it, but you do. Um, we're forever in your debt. And it's very good of you to, I know you'll be helping Kathy uh, line up another splendid uh, program for us for next year. Thank you very much for doing that. But goodness, we all recognize you need <clears throat> to take a break from what is a very onerous task, which starts right now, looking ahead <coughs> to the next program. Um, you really always produce that program in very good time and very efficiently. <coughs> and it's always just so varied. And in a sense, your own talk this evening um, <clears throat> reflected that variety that, that we've enjoyed because you not only gave us some splendid birds, but all that other additional wildlife and also a feel for the life of the place you were talking about, which came over so clearly uh, <clears throat> by your Zoom presentation and through, through your own um, such individual commentary, which over the years we've, we've really grown to enjoy and to expect. But thank you very much indeed. And it's lovely to see someone like yourself that's never lost the thrill, that fresh thrill of spotting wildlife for the first time, perhaps as a child, or even when you come to bird watching and natural history as an adult. It's those first moments that, that mean so much in which you remember, and which in your case, just, see, just keep coming. Um, and you seem to relive those moments of course through through your young your young family and in every way your talk was a modern version of uh, Gerald Durrell's famous uh, story of an idyllic uh, island uh, or an idyllic island life on Corfu and you were as descriptively entertaining as Gerald Durrell that's for sure it was a splendid evening uh, and a fitting end to what has been a splendid year Steve thanks ever so much Please thank the rest of your family for being, for allowing us to see them on holiday this evening and enjoy what they clearly enjoyed. And it's lovely to think of sun and warmth and birds and wildlife as uh, we look forward to the rest of the year. And I just hope everybody keeps safe and has a, a super year, a bit more normal, uh, with more things to enjoy, more horizons to explore. And we really look forward to your company again in October between